Hello and welcome to Seattle City Makers. I'm your host, John Scholes. Well, it's great to have you here, everybody, for our latest episode where we sit down with uh, another individual who's not from Seattle, not based in Seattle, uh, but is a city maker in his own right and a maker of high quality public spaces and has had a hand in helping to turn around and transform a couple of downtown parks and public spaces uh, over the last decade. Uh, Dan Biederman joins me, and Dan is the uh, founder of uh, the Bryant Park Corporation, uh, an entity, a nonprofit, uh, private entity founded with the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the chairman of Time in the 1980s. And that entity led the transformation of Bryant Park, a nine acre park in Midtown Manhattan that was uh, a place that not many people wanted to visit or go, a place home to a lot of illegal activity in the 1980s and uh, early 90s. And uh, today, under Dan's uh, leadership and the leadership of his team that he's built there and the millions of dollars that have been invested, it is the gold standard really for uh, urban parks around the country and really around the world. Uh, Dan has had a hand uh, since transforming Bryant Park in creating some phenomenal uh, parks and uh, public space experiences around the country and around the world. Clyde Warren Park in uh, Dallas, Salesforce Park in San Francisco, Military Park in New Jersey. He's worked in Berlin and many other places. He worked in Seattle back in uh, 2014 and 2015 when the Seattle Parks Foundation brought him out uh, to work with them and the Downtown Seattle Association and other community groups uh, to develop a strategy to transform and activate Occidental Square Park in Pioneer Square. Uh, Dan wrote the strategy and the Downtown Seattle Association ran with it. And since 2015, we've been managing and programming staffing, bringing events and music and food uh, and games and other activities into that space and into Westlake Park as well. And those two spaces are much better for it. Uh, and Dan certainly had a hand in um, helping us apply the best practices to those downtown uh, public spaces. And he's back in Seattle. Uh, the Downtown Seattle Association and the City of Seattle retained Dan and his team from Biederman Redevelopment Ventures, uh, a consulting practice that he started in the 1990s to really help uh, cities and organizations like the Downtown Seattle Association uh, transform neglected and challenged public spaces. He's back in Seattle working under a contract with us and the City of Seattle to take an assessment of our parks and public spaces uh, in downtown uh, and uh, help bring forward some recommendations and strategies for enhancing them, making them more positive, welcoming, active public spaces uh, for everybody. And so we took the opportunity to sit down with Dan and invite him on the podcast when he was in town with his team and they were out and about on the streets of downtown uh, going through their assessment and kicking off uh, this project. And uh, on the podcast, we discuss uh, well, what they're seeing and their first impressions uh, being here in Seattle and taking a look with uh, a lot of experience behind them at our public spaces. We talk about the current state of Bryant Park post-pandemic. Um, we get his perspective on what it takes to bring people back to, uh, to our downtowns, to our cities, uh, to our parks and public spaces, uh, discuss his favorite project, his most challenging project, and his favorite city uh, to visit. We didn't ask him the standard question we asked at the end of our interview, which is your itinerary for your perfect Saturday in the city of Seattle, but we get his take on his favorite city to visit. So stick around uh, for his answers there. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dan Biederman, the founder of the Bryant Park Corporation and founder and head of Biederman Redevelopment Ventures. This is great. This yeah. is fun. Well, thanks for making time for this. Um, of course. You, you've, you and your team have been out, I know, uh, sort of assessing our parks and public spaces downtown. What are your initial reactions just about downtown generally and what you're seeing in some of our public spaces? And and be honest, we can take it. Dan. Okay. <laughs> we can take well, it. Well, this is exactly what I said to uh, the team. We are delighted with the way DSA kept up the work we started at Occidental. And uh, I'll contrast you with your friendly rival in Oregon. Uh, <laughs> we left similar instructions in Portland and your equivalent uh, uh, group there did, well, it was the parks department, did not do a good job. So when we left, it fell apart and there were, ga there were gang shootings and the like. This is in the Lloyd Center area. Yeah, And that was a plan you wrote for the city to implement down there? Not so different from what we did for you guys. Yeah. So we come back, I've heard good things from people and we come back this trip and I said, look at this. They really kept it going. They're faithfully fighting. There used to be drug dealers over near the totem pole 
not there anymore. And Occidental, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is fantastic. So Occidental, um, you know, we always think we have some ideas that um, might be helpful. But, uh, we'll we'll um, give you some and see, see what you think. Uh, but Occidental is well on its way considering the conditions you're fighting nearby, which to make it not your normal public space. And, and this is also uh, facing the headwinds of the building next door, which you know the name of. Uh, yeah, the Grand Central Building, which uh, you know, kind of shutting of, down. Yeah, not yeah. a lot of activity at the ground level right yeah. now, at least. COVID and that nearby esplanade that you and I were walking, um, not being as active as it was when we were here. Um, the most, I'll switch to the most difficult, City Hall Park and Prefontaine are gonna be a challenge. Mm -hmm. For you and for us and for everybody um the uh grade is only part of the issue the grade of city hall park but it doesn't lay out easily for a an aggressively programmed park in fact i just sent my team over there uh to cogitate i said it's been 26 hours since we were here last i really want you to come up with ideas without me i have some but i'm not going to tell you and, and this was for City do. Hall Park? Uh, or, City Hall Park, yeah. yeah. And then, So they're looking at it right now. It's got a chain link fence around yeah, it, right? Yeah. So you're... St yeah, and, and, and everybody... Like, go stand on the other side of the chain link fence and imagine. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what we did a couple times. <laughs> uh, the, in fact, one of our staff members who's female went there in the middle of the night to see what was going on. And she said it wasn't as bad as we expected. So I was delighted that she was willing to put her body on the line because we heard from adjacent property owners, it's not a good scene. Yeah. Um, Prefontaine is an odd space. Um, this is the fountain at the Yeah, the fountain where the subway entrance station entrance of is. the, yeah, the Quintessa, rail station, Pioneer Square. Quintessa building next door. Mm -hmm. um, it's the grade, it's the presence of guys from, we understand an adjacent building who have um, some illegal activities in mind. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, those two are programming challenges, and I think they have to have beautification. And Seattle has this nice climate for plantings and the like. I think the lighting has to be great. Mm -hmm. So we're going to work. So there's hard some aesthetic, physical things that you think beyond just kind of any programming you might do that yeah. just shift how people see and experience those spaces. Our typical approach is uh, programming is good, but you have to do physical improvements yeah. too, and. In a situation like that, where you're really trying to draw people with empty buildings next door, like the county building, um, uh, they have to be spectacular that people actually want to go see them. Much like the spheres, you know, as a part of our field trip around town, we to went see to the see the Amazon waterfront campus. and the spheres. Yeah. And uh, uh, so people are clearly at certain times coming to see that because it's spectacular. So, Do you subscribe to the notion that? You know, if a space looks great, people will treat it generally in a good way. And there's some kind of universal, you know, standard of behavior in how people engage with a space. If it has a high quality design and well-maintained, yeah. even if it's not heavily programmed, there's not a ton of use. Almost always. There, um, I'm trying to think the first time. Before I was in this field in the late 70s, a year or two before I got the Bryant Park job, I was in... Um, St. James Park, and they had these low-slung um, picnic chairs. And um, I knew the queen owned the parks. It was called Royal Parks Enterprises. And when I got back, I said to somebody, they were renting them for 70 pence. At the time, it must be several pounds now. And I said to somebody, why are those staying there? Because uh, London had some disorder at the time. It wasn't as great as it is now. And the guy said, those are the queen's chairs. Who would touch them? And besides... The, the park is so great. It just doesn't look like a place you can pilfer something. So that's generally true. If the place looks good, people will not do much vandalism in it. Um, so you got to elevate it quickly mm -hmm. from mediocre or poor to great. And you're right. Then you can do some nice touches. It goes applies to restrooms also. Has the post-COVID reality that's affected our downtowns, urban places, is it, has it changed how you and your team approach assessing turnarounds of parks and public spaces and how to upgrade them. It seemed like you had a pretty tried and true formula pre-COVID of understanding, okay, what's the density of office workers around this public space and other in residential and, and that, you know, that, that then for had some potential for use and activation of a space. You've got a, you've got an, an audience and a, um, <clears throat> you know, 
potential users here. Now you got to give them a reason to be here by doing certain things within that public space. But now that we've got fewer office workers and yeah, and, and lots of other changes, does it does it challenge how you would approach this work previously? Yes, uh, you have to work a little harder to get people to actually to come a distance uh, to see what you're doing. Uh, but then it becomes part of the environment. There are still, I look um, in New York at the suburbanites as opposed to the tourist, because you can tell who's not from, they don't have a shirt that says Detroit Tigers or St. Louis Cardinals on it if they from the adjacent mm-hmm. suburbs. And you can kind of tell some of them actually have suburban stuff on they're wearing. And they still are finding, now the COVID's over, as well, at least as it's perceived, they're still finding New York an engaging place to be. And I bet if we interviewed them, they'd say, well, we went to the Met Museum and we came down Fifth Avenue. We knew Bryant Park was there mm-hmm. um, and um, we wanted to shop at Macy's. So you have to have a number of features that are exciting enough that they'll change their patterns they got into in the last few years of never coming into New York City mm-hmm. and fa- fight the general um, tendency of people to be proud. We have exurbanites who are delighted they haven't been in the city of New York in years. They broke brag about it. You know, I never go to the city. I, last time I was there was 16 months ago. You have to fight that because, um, you know, I live in the suburbs. There's, It's nice to be there. It's peaceful. I like to watch birds and hike and the like and ride a bicycle and run. Mm-hmm. But um, there's not much to do uh, at nighttime and weekends like New York City has. So but you need to have, give them a good environment also. So do you, is the notion then that to, for a city, a downtown, or in a specific public space to be successful post-COVID, we're having to draw people in from further distances because the reduction in the density of, of office workers who are sort of right there on top of the park or the space or whatever it may be to begin yeah. with. Yeah. And does then the seem to me then the quality of the experience whether it's in a park or anywhere else in an urban area is now got to be much better if you're trying to draw off people from further out absolutely and you seattle has some really interesting things to see and i we just got a very nice tour of um the waterfront project and that's gonna almost be symbolic of a friendly attitude the city has towards biking and and walking um i think the tourists are already there and it's been in construction um, we saw a ton of empty nesters um, mm-hmm. on a fairly cool Wednesday morning. Mm-hmm. So um, um, when you already have some things that are pretty neat and you add, it, add that to it, I think uh, um, you will have achieved what we all say when we say you have to work harder. Seattle's already working harder. That's that's a complicated project. and It's been interesting it's like to see just, I mean, it's been a construction zone for years, but the number of people all seasons of the year that want to walk down there and stroll from one end to the, the other is pretty substantial. And, you know, it's not the most pleasant place to walk right now because it's, you know, still kind of torn up, although it's coming well, together and soon it'll be open. Noise. But, uh, it's great to see just the demand down there. For- I'm, I'm not a, your typical looker around her because I have interests that nobody else has. For example, you stand on one of the uh, pedestrian lanes there and I was saying to myself, is there another place in the United States where you can be in the heart of a busy, famous downtown and stare at an entire national park? Right. You can see every <laughs> inch, except I guess you can't see Mount Olympus from, um, from there. I guess it's you hidden see the by the brothers, but yeah, you yeah. can't see Olympus. But the, it's good enough. I mean, that <laughs> is counts. not true. You can't see Yosemite from San Francisco. Yeah. You can't see State Park in this case, Adirondacks from New York. It's 300 miles away. Boston. I, I was going through, there's not a single big city where you can see something that spectacular. And obviously, um, you know, there are eight glaciers there. I mean, who, and, and you have Mount Rainier also, yeah. but the view at, um, except if you go way out on the pier is, at the waterfront project is uh, Olympic National Park. And it, it's just, people are going to go gaga over that. Right now, they could see it, but they also can see construction vehicles. Yeah. When it's all right. finished and paved and everything's great, they're going to love the experience of being there. I, think. I love that line. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal that. <laughs> there what, are, I, what I've said before is, I'm pretty sure. I don't think there's another downtown where, you know, out in the bay, you can occasionally see an orca whale swim by that's that's a and comparable then, experience if, you know 60 70 miles to the east you can you know go on a trail run with a 
herd of elk that are wandering around. And that's always that's a, been San Francisco's boast. But this, I'm almost sure, you know, the um, Portland, you know, given their disorder there, it's a shame because I used to tell people, you know, when you take the um, uh, subway to the airport, you're seeing volcanoes right and left. It's mm-hmm. Mount Hood is right there and Mount, Mount St. Helens. It's fantastic. Um, but that's not from downtown. You're not, I, yeah. as I recall, you're not really yeah. seeing them. So you guys have something pretty spectacular there. Big, big nature and and big urban. I think we've yeah. got this great air combination. Yeah. So you mentioned Bryant Park er, earlier, and we were talking about it yesterday when we were standing around in Occidental. But what was the what was the park like during COVID? What was the worst day, and then what was the transition to back? You know, back to what people sort of would expect and know and love about that vibrancy in the park. How long did that take and what what was that like? Uh, Difficult. um, All, everything was difficult. We lost 5 million out of our earned income uh, in the first month. We knew we were going to lose 5 million out of total budget of 21 million. Um, Attendance was well down and we debated, should we close the park? Because Midtown is so deserted because it was deserted the first month or Mm -hmm. two. And we said, no, we're going to, this is really important. We're going to keep this going as a safe haven um, number of emotionally disturbed people was substantially up and they'd come in. It wasn't gangs. It was one every five or 10 minutes. And that was more than we normally have. We don't have anybody like that now. We have 4,000 everyday people and no emotionally disturbed people, mm. no drug addicts, nothing. And um, so that was bad. And the office workers weren't there. Um, but they started coming back earlier than the... Um, press is willing to concede. They're 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 back now. Um, the the, the uh, I'm have I have this debate that's very humorous. I say, um, you know, Midtown is really busy now. Don't believe what you read in the New York Times. And people say, no, I understand it's deserted. Nobody's there. And I say, no, not true. And they say, but the turnstile counts are down in the office buildings. And I say, yeah, but they're, they're, I guess these people who are wearing dark suits, white shirts with no tie, which I call the uniform of <laughs> the, the young generation, <laughs> they're just coming into New York to walk around on the sidewalks for display. They're not going to offices. <laughs> so the, I, this argument, I've, I've had this five times a week. They say, well... They're coming in and they're walking around the streets and then they're meeting somebody at a restaurant, but they're not going to offices. <laughs> and I say, I have a And they simpl- dressed up for the occasion. <laughs> I have a simpler explanation. The turnstile counts are wrong. <laughs> so this is a big debate. Do you think it's a conspiracy right by the reporters to work from home forever? <laughs> well, the New York Times, I understand, is not at, at work. And um, they're the prime... Um, uh, spreaders of the idea that Midtown is deserted. Yeah. Uh, so maybe, um, but it, Midtown Manhattan is really busy now. Even Monday, even Monday feels like it's half or two thirds back. Friday is is quieter. And and uh, your pedestrian numbers in the park are about back to or yeah. back to what you'd expect. Third, we had thirty one twenty um, on a nice day last week at a one o'clock count. Fifty four percent women, which is always a good sign. And um, uh, that's very close to the 2019 number. And um, the restaurant there is doing uh, 20, it's on pace for $29 million top line. And it was 24 last year. And the 2019 number was 21. So um, we've done some clever things to make it more popular because street eating was in these kind of crummy shacks and people didn't really love it once it got run down. Whereas in Bryant Park, you're eating outdoors, but you're protected from street traffic and noise mm-hmm. and anybody dropping and by and giving you a hard time. Yeah, yeah. There, we added a lot of tables and nobody gave us a hard time. City has been very cooperative. This new mayor, Mayor Adams, is, is um, how would you describe him? He's an upbeat, positive kind of guy who wants people to come back and um, is not apologetic about mm-hmm. it. What's the short version of the origin story of your involvement in turning that public space mm. around? It was How did you find your way to that park? Stroke of luck. Um, <clears throat> I went to um, uh, a meeting. I was chairman of the local community board, and I was looking to have a new job that would be m- more public than my prior job, which was to be a computer consultant for the city's um, budget redo. And... Um, 
a, a, a guy who, who I was on the board of his group told me, hey, there's a competition for who's going to run Bryant Park. You should enter. It's a bake-off. There are seven people already in. Um, and I said, how did this get generated? And he said, very funny, Mrs. Astor, who is a famous uh, donor in New York, the, all the Astor money that came from this region actually ended up in her pocket. Um, and she gave away incredibly generously. She was walking into the library one day and um, was accosted by a drug seller who gave her a hard time. And she was dressed like Mrs. Astor. She was maybe 82, dressed very expensively. So she goes into the meeting at the library, one of her prior inst a prime institutions she cares about. And David Rockefeller, luckily, is there, mm -hmm. the world's most effective human being, in my experience. Mm -hmm. He died recently at 103 years old. And she started lecturing him about something must be done immediately. And you Rockefellers can fix this. You have the power and the money and um, we, should, we should fix Bryant Park. So he didn't know what to say uh, about how they would do that. So he went back to the office, assigned it to a brilliant guy who ran the Brothers Fund, Rockefeller Brothers Fund. And they started up this competition that I entered. And... Um, I was interviewing people I never dreamed I'd meet, the chairman of Time, Inc., William H. White, Jr., who I know you, John, know about, uh, but not everybody does, but the, the great uh, urban mm -hmm. philosopher and public space expert. He interviewed for the Rockefellers. Um, I may have been lucky because he went to Princeton, and so did I, <laughs> so he, he was biased in my favor, but he had known who I was. So several others, the chairman of the library, who was the chairman of Charles of the Ritz Perfumes, and... Um, uh, got the job and then started with nothing. I was, uh, I didn't, I was too nervous to spend the Rockefellers money. So I started, um, the first year and a half, I didn't have an assistant and I got an office in an abandoned building because I didn't want to spend money on rent. I said, I'm not sure I'm going to come up with something to fix this. So, uh, in the state of the park at that time. Oh yes. Uh, 500 felonies, um, the year I took over. So that's, um, uh, homicide, uh, assault, rape, uh, uh, grand theft auto, grand larceny, et cetera. Um, smell of urine everywhere in the park, everything broken. Uh, drug markets, there were nine separate drug markets at each entrance. Different, different ethnic groups, they each had their own drug market. Um, and uh, uh, just a terrible situation. The city was spending $110,000 a year on the park, basically barely picking up the litter. And the trash cans were old oil drums that had had mm -hmm. the sides taken out. That's kind of a symbol of urban decay in my mind. So uh, we uh, started from scratch, programming, spruce ups, picking up litter, and it took 43 years. I can I, I condense it now for clients of my consulting firm. I say, it's not gonna take 43 years. I'm gonna get you up to <laughs> five or $6 million budget pretty quickly, but that took 43 years to figure out. So we've got a $25 million top line now. And so we can do a lot of things that somebody comes to me with an idea for my staff. I almost never say no, if it's reasonable at all. And the great thing about having staff around a lot of the ideas, um, come from them, mm -hmm. 23 year olds, barely out of a liberal arts school in the Northeast. And, um, they're saying, what if we did this? And so it's, it keeps accelerating the level of programming. And you've gone on to build a company that's helped cities and groups like ours and others around uh, the country transform public spaces. Do you have a, a favorite project? And do you have one that was most challenging? The um, We've mo mainly had successes. We failed occasionally. Um, some of it might be our fault, some of the client's fault. Um, some clients don't listen to us, which I find out within usually six months. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, Texas projects, Houston and Dallas. Um, Houston is a great park. Uh, 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 Levy Park in the River Oak section, more or less, of Houston. Uh, um, a great conversion from an athletic kind of rundown park run by the city to a more Bryant Park experience. And then um, Clyde Warren Park in mm -hmm. Dallas, which is a deck park. Over the freeway there, right? Yeah. Oh, a freeway used to split uptown and downtown Dallas, mm -hmm. and it was noisy and 
Um, people didn't really cross over. You have the Performing Arts Center on one side and upscale housing and office on the other, and this was cratering value. So those two, that's, that's a brilliant group of uh, clients on the board there, really devoted to it. And, um, those would be two of my favorites other than Bryant and mm -hmm. the New York work. Most challenging? Uh, another Dallas project we're in right now is challenging. I don't want to be too controversial here, but the client, uh, we've got a partners who have different ideas than we do. And it's a challenging project. It's 277 acres. It's where the Cotton Bowl is, mm -hmm. for people who know Dallas a bit, and um, where the State Fair is. And um, to bite pieces of it off and turn it into something great is hard. I wouldn't say necessarily the most challenging, but the most that's conceptually difficult um, to figure out how to do that. We're currently doing a community park. Um, it has a history of... of bad behavior towards the adjacent African-American community. They weren't allowed to come to the mm. state fair. Um, and they're still skeptical, some of them, but we're, we're breaking that down. Um, our programming there, if we just did it and didn't drag somebody to see it, would be um, underpopulated. So the solution has been a group we're working with in the city for good. Um, tells all the mothers, I'm taking your kids to Fair Park and they're going to have a wonderful experience in nature next to the lagoon there. And we're running all these exercise programs so the kids come and buses and the like. And that's it's breaking down the distrust of that community. But that's conceptually difficult. We've had a few universities who didn't listen to us too much, MIT and Princeton being two of them. My controversial theory of university administration, which I shouldn't tell you on a podcast, is <laughs> that uh, the less prestigious the school, the more brilliant the administrators. <laughs> so <laughs> when I got up to the MIT and Princeton level, they, they were skeptical um, and didn't do exactly what we said. But um, uh, other schools, you know, the very interesting dynamic with the Catholic schools who want to be Notre Dame or Boston College. And... Um, they listen to every word we say, and the administrators hustle because there's no endowment there like Notre Dame right. has right. and uh, or Harvard. But um, challenging, you Hardy was our architect for the Bryant Park Grill, brilliant, famous architect. And I was showering him with praise one day about the building he designed for us. And he said um, something I've always remembered. He said, Dan, good clients make good architecture. He just deflected all the credit back to us. So I I, uh, I see that in um, work. When there's a good client, we do well. Sometimes, like in Dallas and Houston, they were very strong. Yeah. Um, but sometimes the clients are not um, attuned. So as someone who's worked in a bunch of different cities and in their public spaces, how do you think about kind of the post-pandemic challenges and and set of situations that uh, our downtowns are grappling with and where do you sort of fall on the need to kind of completely reinvent these places and who they're for and the use of office and this or that versus, you know, we've always had some amount of headwind and we've had pandemics and there's a set of basics and fundamentals that have always been true to drawing people to urban places. Do you think we need to radically remake them or focus on, kind of the nuts and bolts and the basics that we've always known to be true. I'm of two minds. One is mostly optimistic, one's slightly pessimistic, um, and a bit controversial on the pessimistic side. On the optimistic side, um, I take comfort from a parallel situation, which is people are coming back to um, bricks and mortar retail. There's no doubt about mm -hmm. it. It was pronounced dead even before COVID, and then COVID was supposed to accelerate it, and nobody was supposed to go to shopping centers mm -hmm. and whatever, and some are suffering. But um, people still want to have a social experience while they buy or while they eat. Um, I think food and beverage is going to do fine in urban areas. So I think there will always be a, a need. Uh, the suburbanites I, uh, suburbanites I described and the tourists who come into New York, there's always going to be a need to 
have what I call a, a head swiveling experience. Come in and say, hey, look at that. We don't see that in, in our town or we don't see that in the suburbs. So I think it's going to slowly, against all odds, against all predictions, accelerate back to people around. The pessimistic piece, and um, I'm really almost in a minority on this in New York, um, it is just not a good idea to legalize drug public drug use and drug sales. It is a terrible mm -hmm. idea. And most legislators in big American cities think it's a wonderful idea. So it's killing New York that the entire town stinks of marijuana, except Bryant Park, because I don't allow it there. Mm -hmm. um, and we almost go beyond um, what we're allowed to do. And there's no smoking, thank God, allowed in New York City Park. So anybody smoking anything, cigars, cigarettes, marijuana, we say you've got to leave politely but firmly. Uh, but uh, open drug use in New York, San Francisco, to some extent LA, certain parts of Chicago, and no prosecution of that is probably got a good chance to make people stay in the exurbs or suburbs. And I mean, me, I'm the biggest booster of New York, and I get home and um, we're eating at the dinner table. My my kids are out of the house now, so it's it's my wife and I, and I. I, the birds are singing in the trees outside and we live 25 miles outside the city. And I say, this is so wonderful. I don't smell marijuana. There's no challenging social condition I have to deal with on our little road here. And um, why would anybody want to go into the city and expose themselves to mm -hmm. it? And I should be the one saying everybody should go to the city oh, at every yeah. time. Yeah. So I think it's tottering. I think it could go either way. And um, the, the people who want those policies are... are graduates of schools where they've been taught that um, tough enforcement of rules against drugs and the like is a bad thing. So uh, I, I think the voters will continue to push for legalization of drugs. And that's, there was during COVID period, there was open uh, injection of heroin on New York City avenues all mm -hmm. over the place. It's incredible. I don't know why people would want that. Are you that. dealing with fentanyl in New York City to the extent we see it on the West Coast and San Francisco here in Seattle? You know, I think so. I'm not the expert on it. The, the drug I used to decry, and I'm not very expert on these at all, but my security chief, who was three-star chief in NYPD, knows all about it, was um, K2 for a period. And I don't know how K2 and fentanyl interact, but... Um, uh, people really acted in strange ways when they were on K2. And um, uh, heroin was a key thing. The only advantage of heroin is the people on heroin are so, um, what's the word, imbalanced. They're, they're ready to pop over. I've trained my daughter who lives in New York City. If you see somebody who looks like this and then I make do an impression of somebody on heroin, you can relax. And if he even says anything to you, just push him lightly and he's going to fall over. You have the advantage because people in heroin, my chief, my security chief says they stand like question marks. But that's not always true with fentanyl mm -hmm. and K2. And and, methamphetamine. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They're, they, they're really acting in violent ways. When people are asking me like you, so how, what's the situation now? I've been saying I'm actually optimistic things are turning around. I'm not sure if the mayor has done something He's certainly not publicizing that he's taking these people off the streets. He said he was going to, and then people kind of let it sit. But I, I think the um, situation in New York is getting better. Slowly here as well. More work to do, but oh, yeah. right glad direction. You that. Yeah, right Feels direction that at least of just getting people the help they need and holding accountable those that are out hurting others. I'd been told that Third Avenue was a real challenge, but in yeah. our walking around, we, we have not felt uh, it was a group of six of us working for you and uh, uh, four of them female, uh, no, three of them female and, and, um, and one from Seattle. And um, we did not feel uh, uh, very much um, confronted or assaulted mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. most of these locations. That's that good. We've been told would That's be good. bad. So, Dan, we usually conclude our podcast by asking for your perfect Saturday in the city of Seattle. But for our out-of-town guests, <laughs> you and Professor Glazer most recently, um, your favorite city to visit, and what are you doing there? Do you have a favorite city? London. Um, yeah. I think uh, one of my lectures to my 25-year-olds is stop this sense of celebration New York has. Um, 
this this line, New York, the greatest city in the world, it would be nice to say if it was, but it's not the greatest city <laughs> in the world. <laughs> they say, what's the greatest city in the world? And I said, I haven't seen everyone, but London to me is the greatest city I've been in. And then they, I get challenged by everybody, why London? And I say, well, let's let's go down tick marks. Um, cleanliness, um, uh, uh, parks, um, transit system, and I go through and I, and I say New York versus London. The only area New York either ties or wins is sports. I think the New York sports world is more interesting than London's. You got to love cricket and soccer to really believe yeah. that London is this interesting. Food, everybody says, oh, food better. I think food in London's pretty good now. And culture, I think, is a tie. New York is fabulous with culture. And big advantage New York has on Chicago and L.A. is there's so much more to do at night. It's not even close. But um, and every other tick mark I've got on this chart, London is better. So that's my favorite city um, to the go to. The one that you didn't note was nobody's carrying guns around, including the police. True. The crime rate is much lower. Yeah. And then I have some American favorites that no one else cares about. I love Cincinnati. Uh, nobody in New York's ever been to Cincinnati. <laughs> uh, and several other ones working, and I love Nashville. And Seattle's great. I had not been here in a long time, but anyway. Was the last time you were here when you were out speaking we're, at our event? Yeah, well, ago? no, and doing that project with um, yeah, yeah, that's right. yeah, Occidental. The event, the event yeah, preceded that work. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, again, it, you know, the proximity to nature. And I also have a sense, if we have time for this last observation, um, our park in San Francisco, Salesforce Park, which is another one of my favorites on top of a transit center. I have a strong sense that the people who use it are, I call them high IQ park users. They really understand what we're trying to do. Um, and I have that sense in Seattle. I think if we make some improvements to uh, Pioneer Square, Fortson, Prefontaine, mm -hmm. uh, City Hall Park with you, people will discover them because as I was watching people on the streets um, near Pike Place Market and elsewhere, uh, beyond the tourists, just Seattle people seem to be high IQ public space users. Mm -hmm. So I think Seattle has great potential. So you mentioned them. Salesforce. I saw an article, I think, this week or maybe last in the San Francisco Chronicle that talked about the park still being used regularly. The transit center underneath it was empty. And of course, Salesforce Tower um, is... You know, not pretty empty, pretty yeah. empty, right? And and I was a little bit surprised by that. That you know, an elevated park, uh, people are still finding their way there, even if they're not in the transit station yeah, yeah, or I the saw, office building. I saw that story. That it had was, to make you feel real good about I, I the was, work that you all did there. I was delighted with that story. And um, Peter Walker, who often we've worked with him in a few parks, one in Berlin right now. Um, he, we don't always agree with him, but he did such a terrific job on that park. Peter Walker and partners persuading the client to do all these expensive forms of vegetation. And then our programming, considering we faced the shutdown because of a girder problem, then a shutdown because of COVID, is, has been really good. That uh, We always point to Toddler Tuesday and Toddler Thursday, 80 people in the midst of COVID mm -hmm. showing up with their little kids. Um, and we have the counts uh, to prove that the the trend line is going up. So um, uh, that's really been a delightful experience, and they 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 get it. It's south of Market area is a little um, still shut down, especially on Mondays and Fridays. Uh, but um, they they know it's there. The the high IQ park users in San Francisco, mm -hmm. like the high IQ park users in Seattle, will will find their way to these things. If you build it, they will come, and the people just expect a high quality space. I think even more so now. Yeah, but I'm you got to manage it. I always, you know, that comes from a movie that's one of my favorite movies. I can't see without bawling, which is almost true of anybody who lost their father at an early age, mm -hmm. like I did. And um, so the actual line is, "If you build it, he will come," uh, because it's about his father. Yeah, coming down, he gets another chance, and uh, the. Uh, uh, so we often, we, we take your, what you said, We've modified we, it. we say the, the real answer, if you build it, they will, or he will come with, um, programming, great programming effort. Cause sometimes the architects, um, not to criticize them specifically want to spend a lot of money, 
using that phrase. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, so the programming is cheap. And we say to the client, the program isn't, isn't expensive. We'll spend $200,000 and bring a ton of people in here. Yeah, yeah and, and people want to be there for those activities, especially in our urban parks. So, well, we look forward to uh, what your team is going to recommend for our downtown Seattle mm-hmm. parks so that we can build on the success that you've already helped us achieve and create great spaces for oh, people thank to you. enjoy. We've been really honored to be spoken well of by you over the years, John. And, um, Uh, Thank you for that, and thank you for giving us another chance to help Seattle. Terrific. Well, thanks for making time. We know you got a flight to catch, and uh, uh, we think we have one of the most beautiful airports around, uh, but we don't want you standing in line in the security to (laughs) enjoy it. So we hope you make it to a lounge or a bar or your your gate with with plenty of time to enjoy the beautiful architecture. (laughs) It's been great to be here again. Thank you for the opportunity. Very good. Well, hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dan Biederman. It was great to have him on the podcast. Always appreciate spending time with him and getting inside his head and understanding his perspective uh, and approach to transforming uh, neglected and challenging public spaces and transforming them into places that we all want to be. And he's had his hand in many, as we discussed, and uh, it's great to have him back in Seattle. Great to have him and his team back in Seattle to help us. Uh, bring more good things to downtown Seattle parks and public spaces. So his team will be delivering a uh, strategy and report set of recommendations to us in the city of Seattle here at the end of the summer, probably in September or so. So we uh, look forward to receiving that and building on the work um, that we've implemented over the last several years to transform Occidental and uh, Westlake Park into spaces that uh, all can come and enjoy. So keep your eyes out for that. As I do each and every episode, I want to close out with a recommendation of what you just can't miss in downtown Seattle. And sometimes this is something new, something that's been reopened, or something that's on its way. And I want to highlight the uh, the soon-to-open new flagship restaurant for Fonte Cafe. This is going to be a full-service restaurant at 5th and uh, Union, between Union and University in the Rainier Square, building 8,000 square feet or so of... Uh, Great food, coffee, beer, wine, and a full cocktail program. Full lunch and dinner service, uh, brunch on Sunday. The space looks just spectacular. I've been waiting for this to uh, to open, and it looks terrific. And uh, they are they're soon to have uh, the doors open here. So uh, go check out the new location of uh, Fonte uh, Restaurant. I think called Fonte Bar actually at. Uh, on 5th Avenue, across from the 5th Avenue Theater. So congrats to them. Thanks to them for the investment they're making in downtown Seattle. This is going to be a terrific new spot. And then the other uh, item I wanted to highlight for you is something to check out that's uh, returning. Uh, Forest for the Trees, which was a a series of art installations and activations in the Railspur project in Pioneer Square. Uh, They debuted... Uh, during the Seattle Art Fair back in, I think it was September of last year. It might have been before that. But they're going to be back and are back, uh, associated with uh, First Thursday down in Pioneer Square um, on uh, June 1st here. And then they'll have uh, some installations during All- All-Star Week, uh, July 7th to the 11th, and then later on in the summer. But seven floors of uh, art installations in the Railspur Project, which is a collection of historic buildings that... Denver developer Urban Villages acquired and has remade and is remaking. Not all of it's open yet, but a good portion of their uh, project is. It's retail, office, residential, and uh, soon to be a new hotel with a rooftop restaurant and bar uh, opening there um, on the corner of First and King. So they've got that uh, building full of pretty incredible art. And it's uh, worth checking out. Forest for the Trees, FFTT.space on the World Wide Web. So check out Fonte and Forest for the Trees. Those are my two recommendations of things you just can't miss in downtown Seattle. And both um, coming this month. Well, we thank you for joining us. And uh, we appreciate uh, your your reviews, your ratings, and uh, subscribing to the podcast. Seattle City Makers is presented by the Downtown Seattle Association with support from James Cito and production by Spark Creative. Mm-hmm.